I came to Southern Oregon College in 1967 after teaching in, the, in Aurora, Colorado for eight years. Uh, taught high school, was department chair, opened up a new school there. Felt that I wasn't challenged and I wanted to teach at the higher, higher education level. So my major professor at the University of Northern Colorado called Esby McGill and said, I've got a young lady that wants to teach at the four-year college. Esby called me and said, you're hired. And I said, wait, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I've never been west of Las Vegas. I don't know if you guys are cowboys and Indians or if you're civil. I, I know I don't go anywhere I don't know about. So I said, I, would, I want to come out. He says, you don't have to be interviewed. The job is yours. And I said, I want to come out. Little did I know at the time that I would have the opportunity to say, would you help with the expenses? Women didn't do that sort of thing. But the year later, when Tom Hitzelberger and Jerry Cooper came out, their way was paid. So there was, there was always a discrepancy, no matter what. Um, anyway, I came out on my own. It happened to be spring break for me from high school teaching. Spring break here, so the School of Business delayed their, Chris, their fall summer party until I could come and could meet all of them. I loved the people. I loved what I saw. The weather was miserable, but I thought it can be miserable in Colorado too, so why not? Why not? So that was my introduction to Southern Oregon College. Um, I met with uh, President Elmo Stevenson. He was late for my interview, came in right off the farm, wiping off his shoes because he'd been out feeding the cattle. And I thought, you are such a down-home boy. And he was just, just like a little grandfather. I loved that man. He was just such a wonderful, fair, fair person. So anyway, met him, met the School of Business faculty, just really liked the people I met and what I saw. Came back to Colorado and I resigned my position there and came back out here in the fall of 67. Um, I, was, I had said to my major professor at University of Northern Colorado, don't expect me to get a master's. I was only interested in a bachelor's. I graduated from high school at 16 and from college at 20, and I was teaching high school, and I was teaching kids that were coming back from the service who were older than I, and I thought, no, I don't want a master's. But then I thought, you know what, I'd be silly not to do it. So I went back in the summers and got my master's. I got here, and when I talked to, Ed, to El, um, Esby, I said, I don't have to get a doctorate, do I? He said, not if you don't want to go any further. And I said, okay. So I got here the first year and I thought, you know what, I looked around and I thought, if they can do it, I can do it. So that first summer, I was back at Oregon State working on a doctorate. The next summer I moved up to Oregon State, and stayed for the year. Uh, they held my position because I was here for two years, got my doctorate, came back and con continued until I finished the thesis and earn my degree. Okay, so that was, I came back in 1970. By then I had all my coursework and everything out of the way, worked on my thesis while I was teaching full-time and was being department chair. 68, I came back in 70. Fall of 69, 70, fall of 70. And I finished my dissertation in the f winter of 71, but they don't grant the degrees until the next year. So my degree technically says January 72. I was the department chair of what, what at that time was called office administration. Then it was changed to office management. And then it was administrative office management and business education. So we had a lot of title changes. We were, quote, a co vocational program. So we didn't get the accolades, we didn't get the funding, we didn't get the whatever that the academics would get. 
And I kept saying to the president and to my department chair, who was then, I think Gary Prickett was in charge then, um, you know what, doesn't it count that our, our kids, our students, who go out after two years, they graduate, they either go on to a four-year degree or they go right out to work and get some high-powered positions. But they're all employed in the area in which they were trained. Does that mean nothing? Evidently not, because most of them were girls. So, you know, we, we were shied away from a lot of opportunities because of that. Um, but that didn't stop us. So we went ahead and we turned out some wonderful administrative assistants, several of them who were administrative assistants in Churchill Hall, and a lot of business ed teachers who ended up in all the high schools throughout, the, um, throughout the, or the state of Oregon, and a lot of them here in the valley, and they've been very successful. So I'm very proud of what we did with, with the lack of support, whether it be verbal or monetary, that we got. Um, were, were salaries equivalent? Absolutely not. Absolutely know. not. Because I know that I took a $7,000 cut to come to Southern Oregon. And when Hitzelberger and Jerry Cooper came the next year, they were making far more than I was, and they were all the way through. Uh, when it came time for promotions, I had to fight tooth and nail to get mine. But I got it. Um, I would apply for grants to go up to Oregon State to get money to help with the, earning the doctorate. I got not because I didn't have a family. I said, I'm a sole survivor and a sole beneficiary too. That shouldn't make a difference. But it did, evidently. So I didn't get any of the, the benefits that way. But I don't give up. I thought I can do it on my own. So I did. Uh, I was going to school full-time at Oregon State and working half-time, so I was teaching half-time up there at Oregon State, yeah. So I, I got to stay in the PERS system, and I still had my health insurance only because of that. Um, Oregon State was good to me. I met my to-be husband. He was my major advisor. And, and he, we worked on a lot of research together. He was known as Mr. Typewriting USA, and I have an article that said, if, if soccer has Pele, we have Fred Winger. And so I did, I, I did research with him in typing. He wrote a lot of drills that are used across America and across Puerto Rico, Mexico, Canada. Um, wherever, and he did a lot of out-of-state out of speaking as well, and was with McGraw-Hill. So we did the research, and I'm proud to say that my kids surpassed his kids <laughs> at Oregon State, because we were on the phone constantly just checking statistics, and I was so pleased, and my, my, re my faculty were pleased too that we could beat them at their own game, so that was good. Um, I stayed, I stayed involved with business education all the way through my career. Uh, I, was, I stayed professional with them, with the, the local business ed, the state, the national, international, the whole bit. Uh, served on many of their committees, held office with many of them. I was Teacher of the Year uh, with the state of Oregon. and. I don't think I applied for Teacher of the Year on the national level. That wasn't, that's not my forte to go out and toot my own horn. If it's meant to be, it'll be. So anyway, came back. Um, I got sick in about 90, 1990, I think it was. That was about the time that Taylor Hall was having the bird feces problem. They had collected more feces outside of my office window than they did collectively throughout the rest of the building. But nobody would listen to me that this was the cause of my immune system. So I was sent up to OSU, I was sent to a, a doctor in Eugene, and they said, no, it's not in your head, you really do have fibromyalgia, and it was bird feces caused. But I couldn't get administration to listen to it. 
And I said to Fred, I said, you know, I'm going to retire. He says, well, you can't do that yet. And I said, why not? He says, well, you can't do that. You just can't do that yet. You've got another couple of years to go before you are eligible for your PERS and whatever. At that point, I didn't care. So anyway, we, I'm going to step ahead a little bit. I was sick, and he and I got married in 93, and I retired in 95. I could, I could not go any further than that. So I missed out on about 18 years of teaching. 18 months of teaching before I got my full retirement pay. I had talked to Reno. I talked to him and he says, oh, okay. And it was almost like, what would it take for you to retire? And I said, well, I need health insurance. I'm not going to be 65. I talked to Nan Russell, who was then the uh, personnel manager. Never once did either of them mention I had been paying all these years for short-term and long-term disability. And I was so sick I didn't think about it. I could very easily have used that to carry out the next 18 months and earn my full per salary, but I didn't. But that's okay. So anyway, um, I retired in January 95 and was sick. <laughs> but I got to spend time with Fred. And so that was, that was a blessing to me because he was older than I, and we had seven years of marriage, but of the seven years, three and a half were sick years for him too. And he passed away in 2000. So that's where that goes. Back to SOU, I went through SOC. I missed the SOCE. I was SOC, SOSC, and then SOU. And um, they were, SOU was good to me. I loved my teaching. I loved the students is what I loved. And I loved the job. I loved the department. I loved what I was doing. And I loved what we were doing as a, a collective group as in a department because we saw success with our students. But I was very naive. You mentioned Kreisman earlier. When I moved down in the fall of 67, he held the door open for me. I had no idea what a professor was. I had no idea that there was rank and file or anything. And I thanked him and I said, oh, you must be, I think I said, one of the good old boys. You're holding the door. I didn't know. <laughs> yes, he was one of the good old boys. <laughs> uh, but he was a wonderful man. I loved that man. Just loved him completely. Um, I don't know what else to tell you. I loved, I loved my teaching here. I loved it. I also got on with McGraw-Hill Book Company because I wrote typing books and shorthand books. And I would speak for them, but never missed a class, and I'm very proud of that. I would travel for them on weekends. I would teach my class on my last class on Friday, and I was on an airplane, taught Friday night wherever I was going, or taught Saturday. I was back Sunday grading my papers like crazy, and I was back to class prepared on Monday. Um, but I too became very famous, and that, that was a feather in my cap. And it was a feather in Fred's cap, because I know that he had a way of saying, you know, take a look at this young lady who, who knows what she's talking about. So I did typing, I did shorthand, and I did word processing. And I'm very proud to say, and I'm bouncing all over the place, but as memories come back, I'm very proud to say that I brought the first word processor on campus. It was a CPT 8000, trained a lot of the administrative assistants so that they could do repetitive letters and things like that. Uh, it then got the computer science program on the ball and they then brought in the little mini portable computers, but we were there first and that was good. And then moved into electronic typewriter. Well, no, we moved into electric typewriters and then into the electronic typewriters. And that was all through my reg regimen. And I, again, am proud of the progress that we made. So we didn't stay behind. We didn't stay behind at all. We kept going. Um, like I said, the students had fantastic jobs. 
I am proud to say that they're now saying, oh, Dr. Scaff, I'm retired. And I said, oh, no, no. Oh, no, no, don't tell me that. I earned every one of these white hairs. <laughs> but I loved all those kids. I loved them all, yeah. When I first came in 67, it was secretarial science. I'm gonna step back even further into my memory bank. It was secretarial science, which was an old nomenclature for that, uh, which just said typing shorthand, yeah. okay? And Mary Chris Chrislieb, who was Dean of Students, also taught with us part-time. She taught the filing part to that as she counseled the girls. She was a women's counselor as well as whatever else she did in administration. Um, Les Robertson was there at the time. He left after the second year with a heart attack. And then I don't know who took it over the year that I was gone, but when I came back, I was department chair. And we went from secretarial science to office management. I became involved with the, uh, what was called PSI, Professional Secretaries International. I joined their group and got them involved with us and we did a lot of interchanges with that and decided that you know we're more than just office management because we were training administrators as well so we became administrative office management all the way through this we still had business education because the girls took the two-year program primarily and got their their technical skills and then went into the teaching aspect of it so they had they had a full four-year degree the guys, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When I got there in 67, I said, you know what? Typing is an important part of everybody's curriculum. And I said, I talked to the then de department chair who was Lloyd Prickett. Prickett. Yeah, Lloyd Prickett, and then he was followed by Gary Prickett. But I talked to him and I said, you know, we need to get involved with the boys, primarily the boys in business administration. Everybody needs to know how to type. And he said, really? I said, yes. I said, I'm going to recommend very strongly, and I followed through with this, that every business administration student, male or female, either pass a typing test or they take the keyboarding class. But they've got to have some keyboarding skills. And they had to prove to me a proficiency of typing at least 25 words a minute with accuracy and with two hands. None of this hunting and pecking stuff. So the boys grumbled and they grumbled and they grumbled because that's, that's a sissy thing. Of course, we're on manual typewriters too. <laughs> um, but then I would see them after they would graduate and they said, you know the most important class we took was typing? I said, I knew that, I knew that. So, you know, that was, that was the preface for keyboarding with computers. And so I'm really proud of that, too. So we made a lot of inroads, and we proved ourselves. Yeah. It seems to me, just looking at photographs, I, you know, I could see that progression from typewriter to electro, you know, electric typewriter to the word processing systems. And you're in all three of those shots, you know? I was there. I yeah. was there fighting tooth and nail. Yeah. We need money to do this. It was we so, need money. So yeah. interesting. So when the word processing um, system came out, it seems to me that word processors were for women and secretaries and computers were for men and computer science or the business program. Did you see that dichotomy? Oh, well? absolutely. T talk to me about that. Absolutely. There, was, there had always been talk about just doing away with us because we were expensive. And I said, how can we be expensive? You don't give us money for equipment. You don't pay us like everybody else gets paid. How can we be expensive? We're producing, I traveling across the United States and putting out the name Southern Oregon College or Southern Oregon State College or whatever the, case, the name was at the time. I'm giving you more notoriety than you got from anybody else in the whole school of business. And you're telling me that this wasn't the good thing and it didn't work, and what was his name? Anyway, they were talking about um, merging us with, they didn't know where. And so the, the guy from computer science says, well, you can merge with us, because it would be a direct fit, keyboarding and computer science. And I said, yes, but we are more than computer science. You're taking us back to secretarial science typing days. We're more than that. 
So no, I don't want to be merged with you. So we didn't merge. We made a name for ourselves. The, the businesses in the valley would call us when they needed secretaries or administrative assistants or whatever because we put ourselves out there. We also had a work study, pro, a, a, not a work study program, a work experience program. And so, you know, the girls and the guys had to be out there and get practical experience. This is what the high schools are doing now, saying if you're going to graduate, you have to have some work experience or volunteer experience or whatever. The kids were not paid, but they were out there earning uh, credits and they were earning experiences, which became more important than credits. We also were involved with, I can't remember what the name of that program was, but the people would come to us and they'd have work experience from years of work and they'd want college credits for it. And we were, we were initiative to that too. So we said, okay, let's see what you have and let's see if we can't equate it to some of our classes and give you credits for that and whatever. And so that, that worked in our favor too. Um, we have a lot of history back there, but we were never recognized for it. In fact, I'm gonna backtrack again. Secretarial science was the, predece was the predecessor to business administration. Secretarial science was there before they ever knew business administration existed. But I didn't have anything to do with that. I may be old, but not that old. <laughs> I, I think actually that transition was a very real transition in the 80s. It was. With, with, um, with, the, with the change in computing technology. I, and, and reading the newspapers, I can, it's very clear to me in the 80s that SOU was, was meeting a regional demand for computing skills. We were. Well, not just the computer, but also the secretarial, the administrative skills. Yeah, but specifically computer, because the, right. the, the secretarial program had been around, but you were training these secretaries to use computers. The computers, absolutely. And, and that the, nobody could afford computers. I mean, That's right. Very rare things. So That's right. Having these graduates with these skills was a very important part That's of the right. SOU's role. Well, and then I would work with the ladies, primarily the ladies in, in Churchill, and I'd say, you know, you're sending out all these form letters, how tacky is it that you mimeograph them and you just put dear Mr. whatever, dear Mrs. whatever, send us money. I said, no, 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 that is so impersonal. Let's have you learn to use the computer too, the CPT 8000, which probably, I think the room we had it in was probably as big as this part of the patio. Yeah, and so they were happy to do that because then they could just type in the names on the format and we taught them to program the name in the right spots and whatever and piece of cake. Yeah. Print the envelopes and away we go. We just didn't have a sealer for the envelopes. It was still the old tongue. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I, am, I am extremely proud of what we did there. And I, I will give credit to my faculty too because I did not do it by myself. I didn't, yeah. Did you have the opportunity to hire women in your role? And did, were you able to influence the hiring of other women at, at the university? Um, in answer to the last question, no, not to the university. To, the, to my area, yes, in some respects. The business administration program began at SOU and when? Were you around for that? It was there when I came. So I don't know how it started or when it started. I do know that it started with the secretarial science program, though. Okay. Yeah. When you were talking before about merging with another department, was business administration not a consideration? No, no, no. We were we were the black sheep because we were we were ostracized to another building. Even we were in Taylor Hall. They were all housed in Central Hall. We were housed in Central Hall one year when they were doing some remodel in Taylor. I don't know what it was. Uh, but other than that, no, we, we were housed and taught in Taylor Hall. So, no, we were never really a good fit with business administration, salary-wise or gender-wise or any other way. And I, I, uh, I wasn't their favorite person in Taylor Hall, and I know that. Keith Carney would say, I knew by your footsteps you were coming in, and I knew what your mood was. So he would say to, who was the secretary then? I'm not in, tell her I'm not in. 
And if the door was closed, I knew he was there, and I said, Keith, I'm still here. I'm not going away. And Gary Prickett and I tangled, too. He says, you know, you're out there supervising student teachers. Who knows what you're doing? I said, you want to come with me? Follow in my footsteps, and you'll know what I'm doing. I'm teaching a full load, I'm supervising student teachers, I'm teaching night classes, I'm chairing the department, we're being successful. No, he didn't want that either. So that's where it was. <laughs> yeah, there was an equity pro problem. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you work with the business community? You talked about interns. We had Were a work experience. the chamber? Did you go to... Like small business development meetings? Was that um, well, not really. We had two different people that worked with a co op. I started a cooperative work experience program, knowing that, that, that the, the kids had to be out in the business. They had to have that exposure, too, which reminds me that in our two year program, they had a two, two term office management se uh, sequence that they had to take. It was on Monday night from 4 to 7, and they had to dress for the office, but not just for those three hours. They had to come to work on Monday morning when they went to class, dressed for the office, and they couldn't get into their jeans or their sweats or their whatever until they went home. We had more compliments from the social science people about, your girls always look so nice and so professional, and they carried that on through. But I wanted them to see what the other part was like, too. And I got involved with the Cooperative Work Experience through the Professional Secretaries International Group. So um, we set up arrangements with different employers to hire these girls, and they would, they would be out there four or six hours a week working free gratis. And then we would have, um, in the second term of this class that I talked about, we would put on a big banquet a professional banquet. We'd have, we would be responsible for the whole thing. We did the decorations, we planned the menu, we did whatever the student union cooked it for us. And we had the business people and the professional secretaries come in to show our wares, yeah. you know, so we could show off. And it was, it was just an expense, a, a wonderful experience. Yeah. You talked about, um uh, having the students uh, dress for work and come to class dressed for work. So you were teaching deportment and presence and behavior as well as the whole thing. Skills. Absolutely. Did you run into, did you, did you have to talk about, um, forgive me, this is a Sexist. commonplace conversation today, but may not have been a commonplace conversation then, but but, but relationships within the office and behavior that was tolerated or not tolerated? You know, that never came up. It was never, it wasn't a part of life back in those days. I so it never came up. I don't believe it. Yeah, well, it didn't come up with us anyway. And I would have Esme McGill come in the, at the end of the second quarter of that administrative office management class and do some interviews with the girls and he would ask them questions and he would enlighten them on some of the things that could happen in an office. But no, I, I didn't. Like I, what? Um, equity. So, so there was a conversation then about at least touching on some of these yeah, issues. Yeah, but it was nothing that we initiated because we would be pointing fingers at ourselves because we were accepting it as a part of our lives if we wanted our jobs, which is not a very good thing to say. Could you talk about um, social relationships on campus? Like, did people do things out of? Uh, I don't. I don't want to presage your question, but I've heard from other faculty that there was a shift in how faculty related during that period of time. There was. There I'm was. You know what your what your observations and experiences were. I used to, lo I loved the first two years there because we, we didn't have a lunchroom. We didn't have the wonderful student union that we have now, but we had a faculty room in Brit where they then had the mimeograph machine and whatever. And that's where we would converge at noon to eat our sandwiches. So I got to know all kinds of people on the campus and, and more so than I ever did going down to the union because by then, you're in your own little group at a little table, whatever. So that was crazy. But um, 
I can remember too that at, when I came as a freshman, there was a singles group that was being started. It was for single faculty people. So I got to know a lot of the single faculty people. And every fall, we would have a singles party. So we would invite the new singles people in. And it was, it was wonderful. So we got to know everybody that way. I think that we were probably pretty cliquish because the, the women stayed with the women and the men stayed with the men. Um, we, didn't, we didn't really have a lot of communication with like the sciences or whatever. We communicated with the music department because we had female friends over there. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot of like um, going out together after work or weekends or traveling together, things like that? There would be with selected, with selected friends, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, like... Maybe families had more commonality? No, kids. no, because nobody had families. You so know, I, I ran mostly with the singles group. Okay. We did have school of business parties once a quarter, uh -huh. uh, and that, that was good. And then we, of course, had our faculty meetings so that we would be over with everybody and get to know them a little bit better, too. I started out on Lincoln Street. There's a, an apartment building there. I was there for two years and then I moved up to Oregon State. And I, sub, I had a two bedroom apartment and I subleased my apartment this, the year that I, or the summer that I went up to Oregon State because I had to have a place to store my stuff. So I talked the owners into putting a lock on the back bedroom. So I stored my stuff there and then came back and had a place to live. And then the next four years, I lived at the London Air Apartments, and then I bought this. And so I've been here since 74. Yeah. yeah. A lot of faculty seem to have lived on Pennsylvania, Morton, Liberty, kind of. They, they were in houses. Yeah. Because Bev and Ruth, Bev, Bev Bennett and Ruth. Right. No, Ruth Bever was up here on someplace. But they were, they were all in houses. I didn't have a house until I moved here. Yeah, so I was always in an apartment. Bev Bennett got to the university in 53. Um, Betty Lou got there 48, I think. Um, Dorothy Stolp was there. Ruth Beber. Br Ruth Beber. Um, McCracken, right? Flora McCracken. Flora McCracken. Uh -huh. She didn't stay very long at the university, though. Uh, she married, what was his first name? She married the guy in science. And then they, they started a family and then she went to the high school to teach. So she was only at the university for a couple years. Right. But that was before I was there even. So what do you remember about those women? The, those, those women who were kind of there before you and strong, strong, committed women, really dedicated to what they were doing and what they were believing in. Yeah, really good role models, really good role models. I mean, again, I was only, what, uh, 27 when I came. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I loved teaching and I loved teaching high school in the office management area. I loved that sort of thing, so it was a good fit for me. But. Yeah, it was, they were just good role models. When you say they were strong women and good role models, what does that mean? What, what does that mean? Oh, I saw them standing up to administration. I saw them standing up for what they believed in. Uh, you know, at the high school level, you didn't have that opportunity or that choice. And I thought, wow, I could do that. I could do that, yeah. So they, they were just really solid, good people, yeah. So Beth Bennett, um, and I, I talked to Joanne Witness, too. Joanne, yeah, there's another name. And uh, Sally. Sally, Sally Jones. yeah. They, you know, those people in the sports program had similar problems. They did. As you described. They did. Yeah. The male-female ratio and the male-female cast them away because they're just women, yeah. But yet they had such a strong influence on their programs too.
And Betty Lou had such a strong influence on the education department. Yeah. And Betty Lou uh, became a, a dean, right? She became graduate dean? She was, yes, yes. Do you remember the circumstances? I don't. Okay. I don't. I just remember that she was the graduate dean, yeah. So when you talk about these women, you talk about them similarly uh, and as, as a cohort almost. Did they eat together? Did they, how did you? That I don't how know. How did you associate them? Uh, that I don't know. I, I, I think of all of those women, I knew Dorothy Stolp the least, but I knew that she was in the theater arts area. And I knew a lot about her because of Fran Madachi, who was in music, and Karen Schaefer, who was in speech. And it was just, you know, you just knew about these little pockets of people. Um, I, 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 can't tell, I can't tell you that I knew them well. I knew them. And you, you talk about these pockets of people. It's not as if every woman on, a camp, on the campus was an ally. It, it was special women. Right, right. Yeah. And I, you know, and I, I don't, and I don't know how we formed that bond. I don't know. Uh, and I'm thinking about Chayla Cox now. I knew her well too, and but I don't remember when she started the Guanajuato group. But she wasn't a, a part of any of the groups that I was in. Of course, she was married and had a family at the time too. Uh, I, I don't know. She's it's, the only woman in languages. Yeah, yeah. And look what she's done with Guanajuato. And she's still doing. <laughs> um, the bird feces in ta Taylor Hall, you talked about how Taylor Hall felt like it was a marginalized building as compared to Central Hall. I, I wasn't really aware of the marginalization or the difference in buildings, the, them and us. And I Were you, don't you, really know about the birds. You weren't here in the early 90s? No. Okay, so you don't know what Taylor Hall was looking like. Taylor Hall had pigeonholes that were about that big, concrete pigeonholes to block the sun. We didn't have drapes, but we had the pigeonholes that would be blocking the south sun coming into the buildings. No drapes. Those holes were big enough for the pigeons to fly in and roost and nest in the window wells. And that's, what, that's where we had all the pigeon feces. And um, let me think of some other names, if I can. Jackie started with an S in social science. Um, oh, I can see him standing right here in front of me. There were several of us that were getting sick. Jackie chose to quit and to fight it through a lawsuit. And he chose, whoever he was, I don't remember his name now, uh, chose to quit and he filed a lawsuit and my Fred says no you don't need to do that he said first of all you're too sick to fight a lawsuit and so I just resigned and that was it for me but it was proved that pigeon feces bird feces are more deadly to us than anything else and they kept saying oh you have Lyme disease you have this you have that I've never been in the woods I've never had a tick on my body Jackie hadn't either, and neither did, well, the guy, the guy was in geography, and he would take the guys and the gals out camping, and so he could have had, but that wasn't his problem either. So yeah, that was crazy. So we were compromised in that building. And they kept saying, they, they kept coming in and saying, there's nothing wrong with the air, there's nothing wrong with the buildings. I retired, I quit in January of 95, and by the spring of 95, they were taking out the blocks. They were putting in a million dollar remodel into Taylor Hall to do something with the air vent system. My office was never warm. It was never anything but too cold. And I would have physical plant come up and adjust the thermostat and they'd say, well, it's okay, it's working. It's down here on our computer. And I said, it's not. So I just would take my own Allen wrench up there and I'd adjust the thermostat. <laughs> Um, but you know, it was it was never good. The the Taylor Hall was never good. What was your office? One twenty seven. Yeah, 
and it was it was a big office there were two of us in there and we had a business ed library on one half and we had high school textbooks on the other half because my business ed kids needed to check out books when they were out there to teach and whatever and I couldn't depend on the high schools to provide them with their materials so yeah it was it was a beautiful office and we had paid Les Robertson for dividers so here was an office and here was my office and then here was another divider so here was a big waiting room with the library and study tables and it was good it was good except it was very cold <laughs> And the air was very bad. <laughs> so you could literally see the pigeons on the other side. Of oh, the absolutely. Window. And I heard them. And I heard them. when even before, I don't know, here's another name from the past, Arnie Wolf. If you ever run across that name, he taught accounting and he was in business ed with me. And so he was on this half of the room and I was on this half. And he used to smoke a cigar. And I'd say, Arnie, no, get rid of that cigar. I can't stand it, please. It wasn't always the cigar. It was the collection of pigeon poop out there. So this just compounded that bad air problem in there. Yeah, yeah. So it was crazy. <laughs> All right, so you told this funny story about open classroom teaching. <laughs> okay. I officed in Taylor 127, which was a big office. Uh, I had an office made on one side, I was on the other, and then we had a big, like a waiting room that had a business ed library and a high school library um, and study rooms for kids and all of that. So that was my office. The, office. the room next door to that was a big room and it was used for accounting, big tables in there. And then as you go down the hallway and you take a quick left, there would be a little storeroom and then another little storeroom that housed all of our digital, or our, not digital tapes, our VC, what are, what are those? Cassette tapes and other, and supplies and things. Then there was a classroom, 131, that had typewriters. 132, right next to it, had typewriters. Then there was another storeroom across the way, and it had uh, the mimeograph machine and surplus equipment and stuff like that. Well, Vaughn Bournette, bless his heart, who was in social studies, decided he didn't want to be down with social studies anymore. He was downstairs and he wanted to come upstairs. So he said, could I use one of your rooms? And I said, well, we use them for teaching. He says, well, how, what about this room? And we opened a storage room door and I said, well, that's a storeroom door. And he said, can I use that? And I said, well, let me tell you some things about it. There is absolutely no ventilation, no heat, know anything and we in the two adjacent rooms teach with open doors we do not close our doors when we teach we have typewriters going all the time or we have people re reciting their shorthand drills oh that won't bother me i said okay so we moved him into that little 130 storeroom and Tom Hitzelberger sometimes would teach in 131. He's a six foot nine giant with a 10 foot voice and not very quiet. And he also had the open door policy. So Von Bournet is in his little room trying to do whatever he did. I'm teaching in 132 and the doors are open and Von Bournet comes in and he closes the doors. I immediately go to the door and I open the door and the kids would know that we have open doors you know so they'd say here he comes so we would be on the lookout for him so when Vaughn would come to close the doors either I or a student would get out and open the doors and then the volume of the recitation would go up <laughs> we were ornery but it was good <laughs> but we had a reputation I can remember too in that same room 132 we had a flood the ceiling roof, the roof leaked or the vents leaked or something, but we had four inches of water on the floor. We didn't miss a beat. We were still reciting our shorthand. We were doing what we needed to do until the bell rang and we were dismissed. And that made the daily tidings even. <laughs> yeah, we were dedicated. We were good. <laughs> but Von Barnett was not a happy camper, but he stayed there. He toughed it out, even with our open doors. Yeah. <laughs> did he figure it out, leave the doors open after a while? He did. He did because he got tired getting up and getting down. Yeah. <laughs>